In conversation with him will be Anushka Ravishankar, co-founder of Duckbill Books and award-winning author of children's books. Hi everyone and thank you for being here in the afternoon to meet John Boyne. Uh, I'll just, I, I feel a bit foolish introducing John Boyne because he's so well known but I'll just um, do a brief introduction. Uh, everyone knows him as I mean, the writer in striped pajamas which is with, so, uh, as the author of the book the boy in striped pajamas. Uh, how many of you don't know this book? Right, so almost everybody does. So, um, And of course, he's written uh, 10 adult books, books for adults, and uh, about five for children. So I'm going to start with the boy in the striped pajamas, since that's the book that most people know. But we'll also talk a little bit about his other books, the books that he's written for adults. Uh, there's a new one now, which is called The Heart's Invisible Furies, which is a marvelous book. We'll come back to that. Uh, so starting with The Boy in the Striped Pajamas, I mean, this, this, there are lots of questions that I'd like to ask, but to begin with, why a children's book? That's the question that came to me while I was reading it, because there are lots of books for adults which are from a child's point of view. Like, um, there's Angela's Ashes, and there's uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, Room. They've all been uh, told from a child's point of view, as, as is this. So, but how did, uh, how did you choose to make it a children's book rather than a book for adults? That uh, well, good morning, everybody, firstly. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, well, when I started writing it, uh, I wasn't really thinking of the difference between, between children's books and adult books. I think uh, a lot of the time these terms are very contemporary publishing terms and marketing terms and bookshop terms. Um, I used to work in a bookshop in Dublin for about seven years and you know, if people would come in and say, where's Treasure Island? One bookseller might say it's in the classics, one in the, uh, the children's section, one in fiction. So I'm not sure writers always think in, in those types of terms. You, you write the story that you're writing and you, um, you have the protagonist, the character, that you have, and it's, uh, but when I gave it in first, I did say it was a children's book because it had a central character, or two central characters, who were children. Uh, although, I, you know, I'd never planned on writing for children before, my first four novels were all adult books, and my ambition as a teenager, in my early 20s, was always to write novels for adults. Uh, so it, it opened up my mind, really, to the possibilities of children's fiction, young adult fiction, what you can do with that in the 21st century, uh, and the, the themes you can explore, which are every bit as uh, relevant and interesting, I think, as the themes in adult books. I mean, the five books I've written with young people in mind, um, three of them explore war, one the death of a parent, and one uh, a child who's exiled from home for being different. So they're all quite serious, serious things. But I've stopped saying that I write books for adults and books for children, I now say that I write books about adults and books about children, which I think is a, an important difference. Yeah. yeah, I can see that because I mean, when you're writing a story, it's the story that's important and not, who, not the audience when, while you're writing it, right? Uh, the story so, and the theme yeah. and you know, what, why you're telling it, you know, what, what, has, um, what has made you want right. to sit down and write this and hope that somebody will read it. Right. So could you tell us what made you sit down and write The Boy in the Striped Pajamas? With every book, it's been the same thing. It's been just, it's the beginning has been just a good idea. Okay. You know, an idea that I had, that I thought hasn't been done before, that I felt I could, I could do. Now, books about the Holocaust, novels about the Holocaust, there's, there's, there's many of them, of course. It's a subject which has been written about, quite rightly, a lot. And if you're going to enter that world, if you're going to write about it, you have to have some new way in, I think. You can't just, um, you can't write what's been written before or just take your information from movies and things that you've seen. You have to have a new way in. And when I had the idea of the, the child who was the commandant, his son, um, it seemed to me like a, an original way into the story. It's, it's also a very, uh, I mean, did, did you start with the theme first? Did you want to say something and therefore you came up with I, the story? I started very much with the voice. Oh. Uh, because it begins in a slightly fairy tale like way. Mm -hmm. One day, when Bruno came home from school, he found Maria, the family's maid, packing up his, his clothes. 
and it continues in a, in a fairly fairy tale like way. And the reader is always one step ahead of the characters in that the reader knows a lot more than Bruno knows. Uh, he is completely naive. Now, one of the criticisms of the book sometimes is that he's too naive. How could he not know what's going on? My feeling about that has always been that, well, it's happening you know, contemporaneously. So it's, it's 1942 when this book takes place. Um, that was happening in front of the world anyway, and we didn't know it. So uh, uh, an eight-year-old, nine-year-old boy who uh, has grown up in a house where his father has always worn a uniform, where soldiers are always going to and fro, isn't necessarily going to ask questions about what's going on on the other side because uh, he's never known anything different. But that's actually one of the concerns that I had. Uh, you know, if it's a children's book, uh, doesn't it expect too much of the reader? So do, do, you, uh, do all children who read the book necessarily know the history that, uh, that you need I, to know as a reader? You really need to know as a reader reading this book. Well, I, I think they, they know um, enough, probably, but I don't think that you... I think when it comes to a novel, you shouldn't necessarily have to know other things. You know, a novel should work on its own terms. There should be enough in that novel to, um, to give you an idea of the world that you're exploring. You know, if, if, uh, if you need to read other books to explain that novel, I right. think maybe you've done something wrong. So, so do you think that someone who doesn't know anything about uh, what was happening in Auschwitz and in the, in the Third Reich would be able to, would they read the story differently, do you think? Have you ever, uh, have you ever encountered a child who's read the book? And well, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a hypothetical because everybody does know, you know, and you are, you are dealing with an audience that generally will know uh, at least something about the Second World War, something about the Holocaust, it's, it's taught in schools. So it's, um, I can't imagine that situation really happening. However, having said that, in schools I've gone into, it's different levels of awareness, and the questions will be different. Now, for example, when I grew up, I, was gr I grew up in Dublin, and in the 80s in Dublin, we didn't, um, we didn't study the Holocaust in school at all. Uh, it, it wasn't part of our history syllabus. So it is now, um, and I think some of that is because there has been um, quite a lot of contemporary authors, not just this, but say Marcus Zusak, who wrote the book Thief, um, Marcel Leitzman in Australia, uh, who've been writing contemporary books for young people about the war, about mm -hmm. the Holocaust, and um, I think engaging with young readers a little bit more on that. So I, I find that most kids will probably know right. a so lot. Just one last question about this, because I know you've been asked uh, constantly about how could Bruno not know. So I was reading an interview of yours in which you've said something that uh, rather curious. So I'm just quoting you now. The idea that Bruno, an innocent nine-year-old, would understand the events taking place around him implies the hindsight knowledge gained only by the passing of time and the study of history, which is what you just said. And to search for a reason why the story, this piece of fiction, couldn't have happened, when I'm never for a moment suggesting that this particular story did happen, is something that I find an extraordinary response from any reader. Why, would, why do you say that? Well, the novel is subtitled a fable. You know, a work of fiction with a moral at the center. It's not a work of non-fiction. I've made changes to the geography of the camps. I've made changes to some things in order to tell the story. And look, I'm a voracious reader. I don't read novels trying to find reasons why they're stupid. You know, and a lot of the time people do that, especially with historically based novels. Right. You know, I would get, I would often will receive a letter. I've written a lot of books set in the past, and I'll get, you know, a letter or an email from somebody saying, Dear Mr. Boyne, I was enjoying your book until page three, <laughs> you know, when you use this color of a coat. When, yeah. And I, I just find that it's a strange way to read books. And particularly when it comes to a book about the Holocaust. I'm just always kind of surprised by people who want to find reasons why this story couldn't have yeah. happened. Yeah. You know, another criticism of the book is um, Shmuel, the Jewish boy, mm -hmm. wouldn't be alive because the children were killed, killed uh, within an hour or two of arriving at the camps. But if you read Night by Elie Wiesel, we're told that uh, as they got off the trains, if you potentially looked older than you, 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 you oh. were, the word would go back through the line to, yeah. Yeah to say that you were. We know that children were kept alive for experimentation. When we see documentaries of the liberation of the camps, there are children there. 
So is it probable that something like this would happen? No, it's not. Yeah. Um, is it possible? Yes. But does it matter? Does it matter? You know, right. it's, for me, it's the emotional honesty. Yeah. Uh, and if, if the book doesn't work for somebody on that level, fine. Mm -hmm. No, I agree with that. Because, um, but you did, you did, uh, I mean, because it's the whole question of the Holocaust and the Jewish, you, you did come across a lot of criticism for, for this thing about, about, you know, this couldn't have happened and you've made, you made the camps look, uh, you know, you made the camps look milder than they actually were. So, uh, some criticism. Um, I think it's, uh, it's often exaggerated. It, it wasn't, right. um, it wasn't that much. And to be honest, any time I've been on a tour, uh, say in the States, for example, where I would often do a tours of uh, Jewish community centers, or around the world where I've been in Holocaust memorial museums, uh, and I'm not trying to sort of be self-aggrandizing here, but I've never had criticism from um, Jewish people. They, they tend, Jewish people tend to feel that as long as the stories are being told, um, that's a good thing. As long as the conversation is still going, that's a good thing. Um, I find the, the uh, criticisms when they come uh, often from, from, from others. Mm. But, um, but that's okay. I mean, like, literature is supposed to inspire debate. You know, it's, 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 it's okay if that happens. And, you know, I've been talking about this book long enough that I can stand up for whatever it is that uh, is the criticism that comes at me. But I, I don't um, mind people feeling that there are, there are issues with it as well. So in, in an interview in the, in the book, that at the end of the book, you've talked about fences and how you hope that this book will, you know, make children understand about fences. So do you, do you feel that uh, children reading the book would make that connection between the fence here and xenophobia in general, which is on the rise all over the world? I Have think you? they do increasingly now, yes. Uh, and again, because my experience is that classrooms are very different than when I was a child. When I was a kid in Dublin, um, everybody was white, everybody was a Catholic, right. um, it was all boys. Uh, I go into schools now and it's completely different. It's, it's all colors, boys and girls, um, different experiences, people coming from different countries to the UK, for example, to the States. Uh, they, have a much, they, they have much more awareness of what's going on in the world. They have much more experience of trauma, perhaps, than um, many of us had growing up in a, you know, a South Dublin middle-class family where you know, the most trauma you'd have would be on the rugby field um, in school. And um, so I find they're a lot more attuned to the world, a lot more intelligent, uh, and a lot more open to understanding issues such as racism, um, um, intolerance of any kind, uh, much more than we were. But having said that, intolerance is on the rise. All over the world, as we see, you know, it, it is. But it's um, it is around the world, and it is among adults often. But kids are different, kids. you know. Kids are different, and uh, you know, one of the things in this book is that Bruno and Schmuel, when they meet a German and a Jew um, on either side of this fence, all they want is to put the war beat away for a minute and play. Yeah. You know, they just want to play. They just want to like throw a football to each other. And kids in schoolyards are much more like that, I think, particularly younger kids. Mm. Uh, so, I, I've got great like, faith in the um, moral courage, actually, of children. And I find that with this book, a lot of schools use it as a textbook, and I will receive like, big folders of mm -hmm. you know, drawings or alternate endings or pieces written by the characters. And uh, those that I have an opportunity to read, I find, have um, a real insight into not just what's going on in the world, but what's going on in their classroom, in their schoolyard. And you just have to hope that they'll grow up and remember that and not forget it. Yeah, that's, that's really wonderful. So, um, just, we'll, we, uh, then of course it was made into a film as well, and I have read somewhere that you were quite happy with the way the, uh, the yeah, film was yeah. done. Yeah, I think it was a uh, good adaptation. So, was there anything the other way around, that you saw something that was done in the film and you felt that... That's what you, maybe you should have done that in the book. Was there any, was there a moment when you felt there was something done differently in the film and you wished, you thought that maybe I should have done that in the book? Um, not really, but I think there are a couple of things in the film that work really well in the film okay. that wouldn't have worked quite so well in the book. An example of it is, um, there's a moment in the book where um, Bruno loses his football 
and he runs, up, he, he runs upstairs to his sister's room looking for it, and he sees that she has taken down all the dolls and replaced them with maps. Now, in the movie, uh, what Mark Herman did was uh, he goes down to the basement, the lights aren't working, he has a torch, and he shines the torch around, and he sees the piled up naked bodies of the dolls, um, which of course is reflecting what's going on on the other side of the fence. Terrific visual image. Um, if I had thought of it, I probably would have used it in the book, but I didn't, Mark did. So, um, but I think sometimes you can, the best film adaptations, are, I think, are not entirely slavish Absolutely. to the book, but you know, adapt it in some way and find a way to tell the story in an in a interesting way. For that medium, yeah, that's yeah. right. So, um, so we'll move on to the next book, which was, I found really interesting, which was, again, a children's book. It's called The Boy at the Top of the Mountain. Would you like to tell everyone a little bit about the book before we... Uh, well, it's, it's, um, it's about a little boy called Piero, who's French, and his, uh, his mother is French, his father's German, and his father uh, fought in the First World War and has been traumatized by that. And um, as I often do in the children's books I write, by the end of the first chapter, the parents are dead. Um, I, I like killing off the parents. It's, it's a very good way of just leaving children on their own to survive in the world. Um, so Piero gets sent off to his aunt's house, uh, but she's a housekeeper in a house at the top of a mountain, uh, and it's at the top of the Ober Salzburg, and um, it's Hitler's Berkhoff retreat. And Piero goes to live there with his aunt, and over the years uh, of the war, we follow him each year as he changes from being this very kind-hearted, decent little boy to being completely brainwashed because he sees Hitler as his father figure. Um, he gets very drawn to things like uniforms, uh, power. And it's, I try to explore just how easy it is for a person to be corrupted. And that's what happens to him. And eventually, you know, the war ends. He's older in the, without giving too much away in the last chapter and has to look back at his actions, some of which are pretty awful. Um, so I was interested in trying to write a book about a child who isn't good because most children's books, including my own, feature children at the center of them who are almost angelic. And um, this boy isn't. He's a, he becomes a right little monster. And... Uh, but yeah, I just wanted to see how easy it was for that to happen, how, 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 we can change, how a person can change. So apart from the fact that you've used, I mean, you've got a central character who's really horrible, who turns out to be really horrible, it's also, I think, uh, you've really pushed the idea that you started out with in The Boy in the Striped Pajamas, which is about in innocence of Bruno, which represents almost a willful ignorance uh, about what was going on. So you've kind of pushed that idea further in this book, haven't you? Where, I yeah, I mean, I don't think I could have written The Boy at the Top of the Mountain if I hadn't written Striped Pajamas, right. because it, it does pick up on some of the, the minor themes of that book mm -hmm. and explores them in a deeper way. And it's possible that there'll be something in that that I'll pick up on and write mm -hmm. something about in the future. And also I felt that the, 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 evil, uh, the evil people are really evil in this book. Like, the, like Bruno's father, who makes an appearance in this book as well, right? Yeah. He, so he, he's really evil in this book, which, which you didn't get a sense of in The Boy in the Striped Well, that's because in Striped Pajamas, everything is seen through Bruno's eyes. And mm. Bruno loves his father. His yeah. father loves him. And one of the challenges in that book was to write a character who's the commandant of a concentration camp, who we know is a terrible human being, but to write him in an almost sympathetic way, because that's what Bruno is going to see. And in a way, it makes it scarier, I think, because you, the reader, again, as I was saying earlier, are one step ahead. You're smarter than the kid. Right. So you can see what he can't see. Right. Uh, so we'll, uh, so these, we'll get on to the adult books, that, uh, the books that you've written for adults. And again, in the, in the history of loneliness, you have, again, pushed the theme of willful ignorance. Did that come after this book, or was it before? Yeah, the history of loneliness was my... Um, second, to my last one before oh. The Heart's Invisible Furies. And it's the most personal book I've written in a way because it's set in Ireland. Um, it, it was this your, sorry. It, it was, was my first time to write yeah. about Ireland, right. which is unusual because most Irish writers do write about right. Ireland, but I never had. Um, and I waited until I had a story I really wanted to tell. And I, what I wanted to write about was the Catholic Church in Ireland, um, the child abuse scandals that had happened. And strangely enough, even though I think it's probably the most important story in 
Irish history, probably since the famine, it's not an, a, a subject that Irish writers have explored. Oh, really? So I took that on, and I, I was thinking, in thinking about it, though, I felt, you know, what writers try to do is write the, the story that isn't told. So I decided to take a character, a priest, an elderly priest, who has gone through his life, who isn't a criminal, who hasn't committed any criminal acts, uh, and is looking back at his life and the changes in Ireland and the way he's lived his life and trying to decide whether he's lived well or badly. Because actually, I started it thinking he was going to be almost a good, pretty much a good guy. But what I discovered as I wrote the book was really he is uh, complicit yeah. in everything. Because the, the big thing in Ireland, some of you may know this, these stories, some not, but it's not so much the people who committed the acts, and there were many of them. It's the fact that the church, the church that everybody knew, that uh, if you went to the, guard, the police in Ireland and said, my child has been abused by a priest, no action would be taken. If you went to the bishop and complained, the bishop would move the priest from Wexford to Galway, from Kilkenny to Donegal, from Dublin to Mayo. And the excuses decades later was, well, look, you know, I got the priest out of the parish. He couldn't hurt the children anymore. But they sent them to Where another parish. <laughs> and everybody knew these things. And even, you know, I went to um, a Catholic school where I grew up in Dublin. My next door neighbor on one side was the parish priest, and on the other side was nine nuns. So, you know, I grew up very, I was an altar boy. I grew up in the very heart of that thing. And the school I went to is a school I write about in, in that novel. And I talk about the things that happened to me when I was a kid and the things that happened to other people that I knew. Now, that's not a novel I could have written, I think, 10, 15 years ago, because through my 20s and early 30s, I felt um, overwhelmed with rage, I would say, towards the church. And had I written the book then, it would have been a diatribe and it wouldn't have been interesting. And it's not a novelist's job to, to do that. Um, so I had to wait until I felt um, that I could look at it from a different side and try to understand it. And what became interesting to me is because I interviewed a lot of priests and, uh, and in writing my own character, Father Yates, was the sympathy that I eventually began to feel uh, for some of the priests because what I realized was so many of these boys were sent into seminaries when they were, say, 15, 16 years old, in the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, when they knew nothing about the world, nothing about sexuality, nothing whatsoever. Um, and then they wake up one day and they're 30, and they suddenly, they're, suddenly they are feeling the feelings that most of us feel when we're teenagers. And did, is it that they looked for, is it that they were pedophiles, or is it that they looked for the most vulnerable people, which are children? I would suggest, and I could be wrong, and people may disagree with me on this, but I would suggest that it's the latter, that they looked for the vulnerable people, that if Catholic priests had been allowed to marry all those years, then their minds would not have been, in the very literal sense of the word, perverted um, to looking at children particularly. It doesn't make sense to me that like, one organization would just um, attract pedophiles, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. So um, while there certainly were pedophiles in the church, I think a lot of the people were just were kids that were themselves, their lives were lost at the age of 16. And, you know, that doesn't justify anything, but it does make you think about how do you fix a church in that situation? How do you, how do you prevent these things from happening again? It's easy to just blame and blame and blame and condemn but it's, that's not a lot of use if you want children not to go through the experiences that I went through and that other people I know went through. Um, also, the, uh, the other book that I uh, read and really loved was The Absolutist, yeah. which was about uh, Featherman in the, uh, during the World uh, the War. First World War, yeah. It was the First World War. And uh, so could you tell us a bit about that, about the difference between a contentious objector and an absolutist? Uh, well, the, that novel, The Absolutist, which is uh, actually my favorite of my own books, um, it's the one I think I've, it, like, when you set out to write a book, what you want to achieve artistically in it is the one I felt, it's the one I felt best about afterwards. Um, the, you know, there the were conscientious objectors that 
would do other things during the war, you know, would work on farms, would, um, wouldn't fight. Absolutists would do nothing, you know, and um, I set up a situation in the book where you've got two young soldiers, but they're gay in the trenches. And uh, I was interested in what it would be like for a gay soldier in the First World War, because that's not something I've read an awful lot about, where one is only really interested in love and trying to form this relationship, and the other is more interested in politics. Mm. And so they, you know, they're both absolutists in their way, because the one who's interested in politics, something happens in the book, which uh, is completely objectionable to um, uh, Will, the, uh, one of the characters, and he puts his guns down and says, I won't fight anymore, I won't do anything until people take responsibility for this moment that happened. Whereas Tristan, the narrator, is also an absolutist because all he cares about is love. Nothing matters to him. He'll shoot anybody, he'll kill anybody. Um, it doesn't, he's, it, it, I hope he's a complicated character, you know, that I think the reader, if I wrote it right, the reader would come away not really knowing where you stand on him, you know, whether he's a, a hero or a villain. But he comes across as quite callous because of the way he doesn't think about human life. Uh, he he is kind of callous, but he's a victim of his own yeah. time and his own circumstance as well. And I prefer characters like that. And I try to do that, at least in my more recent books, uh, as I've got a bit older, I've tried to write those kind of characters. I mean, we're all capable of acts of great kindness and we're all capable of cruelty. And I dare say everybody in this room has committed both, myself included. So I tried, I'm trying to write real, authentic characters who aren't perfect and who I hope a reader will get to the end and just not know whether they think that guy was a good guy or a bad guy. That's right. Even, even in the latest book, The Heart's Invisible Furies, the character is Cyril. quite flawed, yeah. right? Seriously he uh, is. flawed. And, uh, you know, he does some really cruel things to the to the people he, he loves even. Yeah, he does uh, uh, some bad things. I mean, this is, for all the seriousness of this conversation so far, this is a comic novel. A, yeah. um, as you can tell, I'm a hoot. So, you know, this, full of, it's, this one's full of jokes. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this is about Ireland between the 1940s and um, a couple of weeks, that you probably know, the, we had the um, equal rights marriage referendum in Ireland in 2015 and became the first country in the world to vote by public plebiscite for equal rights marriage. So in this, I wanted to explore how does a country go from being this bastion of conservatism, of Catholicism, to being the first country that would do that by, you know, 60% to 40%. It's of all the countries in the world that you might have expected that from. I think Ireland would have been pretty low down on, on the ladder. But Cyril, the narrator of this book, is, is a little bit too late for that because he's born in the 40s. So by the time the referendum comes about, he's in his 70s. But at the same time, he stumbles through life, I think, making mistake after mistake, but is very optimistic. You know, he's a cheerful character. Like, he does really, only really one bad thing, which is marry a woman, which, you know, a gay guy probably shouldn't do. Um, and, but, you know, one of the things that, it's the truth that, like, you know, if you look again, not just in Ireland, but in other countries, that in Ireland during all those years, um, you know, if you were 30, in your 30s or 40s, you were a teacher, say, you weren't married, questions would be asked. You could lose your job. Um, it, you know, it wasn't decriminalized until 1993, for heaven's sakes. So um, he's gone through this experience and time and place where his nature, the way he was born, is just um, against the law and... It, you know, he works for the government, he works in the, the Irish Parliament, he could lose that job. It's, um, it's, a, it's a difficult time and place to be. So, uh, the thing is that I, I feel that a lot of your protagonists are quite easy to dislike, right? Like, and like you said, it's, an, it's a choice that you've made because we're all flawed. Uh, but I also find another thing, recurring thing that's uh, there, it's obsessive love. Yes. In a lot of your books, uh, your protagonists well, are obsessively of, in love. I've been with a victim of people. obsessive love <laughs> from so many people in my life. Um, no, um, that was a joke. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's obsessive love, there's friendship and loyalty, uh, which runs through all the books. Um, but it's one of those things you look back on, I think, as the writer, mm. and you see it there. You don't set out thinking in each book, I'm going to 
you know, replicate the same themes, but you, you recognize them afterwards. You know, I think somebody said that, you know, a, per a writer just writes the same novel right through their life, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, there's a lot of obsessive love in this. <laughs> In a, so, so, so when you start writing, do you always have a theme that you want to write around, or do you start with the story first, or does it happen both ways? Like, um, it's a little bit of both. It's it's just a basic idea, you know, a basic idea and a character. So, f for this, it was just that. It was like seeing how did Ireland change, and I thought it was going to be a, quite a sad book. I thought it was going to be somebody looking back at their life and feeling regret uh, for for never having loved or being loved yeah. uh, for having made many mistakes but because it goes through like it starts um, it, it moves every seven years of his life and the childhood chapters are I think I hope kind of funny yeah. so the tone just changed completely and I just decided you know I, I knew it was going to be quite long and I thought you can't have 600 pages of absolute misery so um, I thought I'd lighten the, lighten the tone a bit. It's also, so, it's also Cyril's character, right? He's quite funny himself. Yeah, he's quite, you know, he's and I think the reader the is on side his side, things, yeah. he, you know, because he's, he's a bit of a lucky Jim kind of yeah. character, you know, he yeah. just keeps making stupid mistakes. Right. Yeah. So uh, could we just have, we read a little bit from the book. This is his latest book and it's, it's a really uh, Quite an epic novel, I would say. All right, this, um, this section takes place in 1959, and uh, Cyril is in boarding school, uh, and he's in love with his best friend, Julian. But Julian has been kidnapped by the IRA for various reasons, and his father won't pay the ransom, and uh, they're sending little bits of Julian back every day in uh, matchboxes, um, a toe, a thumb, and an ear so far. And Cyril thinks that maybe because of these terrible sexual feelings he has in his head, that uh, God has done this. He's brought this terrible thing down on his head. So he does what every good Irish boy does at some point, which is he goes to confession. And uh, this is what happens. And I hope you don't mind a little bit of rudeness. So. There were a couple of dozen people scattered around the pews and staring into space, all of them old. And I walked past them looking for a confession box with a light on. When I found one, I stepped inside, closing the door behind me, and waited in the darkness for the grill to slide open. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned, I said quietly when it did. A gust of body odor rushing toward me with such force that I reared back and hit my head against the wall. It has been three weeks since my last confession. What age are you, son? Asked the voice from the other side, which sounded quite elderly. Fourteen, I said. I'll be fifteen next month. Fourteen-year-old boys need to go to confession more than once every three weeks. He said, I know what you lads are like, up to no good every minute of the day. Will you promise me you'll go more often in the future? I will, Father. Good lad. Now, what sins do you have to confess to the Lord? I swallowed hard. I had been going to confession fairly regularly since my first communion seven years earlier, but not once had I ever told the truth. Like everyone else, I simply made up a collection of ordinary decent sins and rattled them off with little thought. Today, however, I had promised myself that I would be honest. I would confess everything. And if God was on my side, if God really existed and forgave people who were truly contrite, then he would recognize my guilt and set Julian free without any further harm. Father, over the last month, I've stolen sweets from a local shop on six occasions. Holy God, said the priest, appalled. Why did you do that? Because I like sweets, I said, and I can't afford them. Oh, well, there's some logic to that, I suppose. But tell me, how did you do it? There's an old woman who works behind the counter, and all she does is sit there all day reading a newspaper. It's easy to take them without her noticing. Oh, that's a terrible sin, said the priest. You know that's probably that good woman's livelihood. I do, Father. Will you promise me never to do such a thing again? I will, Father. All right, then, good lad. Is there anything else? Yes, Father. There's a priest in our school who I don't like very much, and in my head, I call him the prick. <laughs> the what? The prick. And what in God's name does that mean? <laughs> Do you not know, Father, I asked. If I knew, would I be asking you? It's another word for a, you know, for a thing. A thing? What do you mean a thing? A class of a thing? A thing, Father. I don't know what you're talking about. I leaned in and whispered through the grill, a penis, Father. Oh, holy God, he repeated. Did I hear you right? 
if you thought I said a penis, then yes, you did, Father. <laughs> but that is what I thought you said. But why in God's name would you call a priest in your school a penis? This makes no sense to me. I'm sorry, Father, but that's why I'm confessing it. Well, whatever it is, just stop doing it. Call him by his proper name, show him a bit of respect. I'm sure he treats all the lads in your school very well. He doesn't, Father, he's vicious, and he's always beating us up. Last year, he put a boy in the hospital for sneezing too loud. I don't care. You'll call him by his proper name, but there'll be no forgiveness. Do you understand me? Yes, Father. All right, then. I'm almost afraid to ask, but is there anything else? There is, Father. Go on, so I'll hold on to my chair. It's a bit delicate, Father, I said. That's what the confessional is for, son. Don't worry, you're not talking to me. You're talking to God. God sees everything and God hears everything. You can have no secrets from God. Do I have to say it then, Father? I asked, will he not just know anyway? <laughs> ah, he will, but he, he likes you to say it out loud, just for clarification purposes. <laughs> I took a deep breath. This had been a long time coming, but here it was at last. I think I'm a bit funny, Father, I told him. The other boys in my class, they're always talking about girls, but I never think about girls at all. I just think about boys. I think about doing all sorts of dirty stuff to them, like taking their clothes off and kissing them all over and playing with their things. And there's this one boy, he's my best friend. He sleeps in the bed next to mine, and I can't stop thinking about him all the time. And sometimes when he's asleep, I pull my pajamas down, I have a right go at myself, and I create an unholy mess in the bed. And even after I do it, and I think I might be able to go to sleep, I start thinking about other lads and all the things I want to do. And do you know what a blowjob is, Father? Because I started writing stories about lads I like, and particularly about my friend. And Julian and there was an almighty crashing sound from opposite me and I looked up startled the shadow of the priest in the darkness had vanished and in its place a beam of light was streaming in from above <laughs> is that you God I asked looking up towards its source from outside the confessional I could hear shouts and I opened the door to peep outside the priest had fallen out of his box and was lying on the floor clutching his chest he must have been at least 80 years old, and the parishioners were leaning over him, crying out for help. I looked down at him, my mouth open in bewilderment, and he slowly raised a gnarly finger and he pointed it at me. His lips parted and I could see how yellow his teeth were. Am I forgiven, Father? I asked. His eyes rolled in his head, his entire body gave one great convulsion, he let out a roar, and that was it. He was gone. God bless us, Father's dead said an elderly man who'd been kneeling on the floor supporting the priest's head. Do you think he forgave me, I asked, before he croaked, I mean. <laughs> oh, he did, I'm sure of it, said the man, and he'd be happy to know that his last act on earth was to spread God's forgiveness. <laughs> Thank you, I said, feeling cheered by this. I left the church as the ambulance men made their way inside. It was an unusually sunny day, and truth be told, I did feel absolved, even if I knew the feelings inside myself wouldn't be going away anytime soon. The next morning, I awoke to the news that Julian had been found. A group of special branch officers had followed leads that led them to a farmhouse in Cavan, and he was discovered locked in a bathroom while his three captors slept outside. Now, had I been a person of more religious scruple, I might have believed that God had answered my prayers. But the fact was, before going to bed that night, I'd already committed a few more sins. <laughs> so instead, I put it down to good detective work on the part of Angarda Shikana, it seemed like the most convenient explanation to me. That was marvelous. So we have five minutes uh, for, for any questions that anyone might want to ask. Give it. Give it. Good afternoon, sir. So I'd like to draw a parallel comparison between your uh, book, The Boy in Striped Pyjamas, and uh, the film uh, uh, Life is Beautiful by Robert Benini. In the film, what happens is, uh, Robert Benini, he fabricates the reality to his son in order to make his son feel safe in the concentration camp. He feels that only adults should know the harsh realities of war happening in the Holocaust, and he doesn't want his son to know. Uh, but in your book, uh, like even the children, uh, through, by reading your book, children know the harsh realities of war. Like, do you think it gives them a nihilistic view of the world and uh, like make them not think that the world is a better place? Uh, I, I, I think you know there are often comparisons drawn between Life Is Beautiful and um, Boy in a Striped Pajamas. And um, I remember when I watched Life Is Beautiful first when it came out, which I think was about 1998, and um, 
I mean, it's, it's an amusing, it's funny as a film, but the thing that always struck me about it was the ending that, um, you know, the boys, the boy lives and carries on and um, it's a sort of a happy ending in that sense. But that sort of bothered me because I don't think there was happy endings. And so, I, I, I don't, I, other than the setting, I don't see a great deal of um, connection between them, uh, even though others often do, which is fine. Um, so, I, I think they're both unrealistic in their way, um, but like I said earlier, it's the emotional truth which is, is present in both, I hope. Hi. Um, here. Oh, yes. Okay, so uh, you mentioned about getting letters about uh, on alternate endings. Is there anything in particular that you thought could have been an alternate ending to the boy in striped pajamas? No, definitely not. There was it was it was the one thing I knew really from the start was that because uh, the boy in the striped pajamas, of course, refers to Bruno, not Shmuel, and I knew that he was going to end up putting on this this uniform, and I knew how it was going to end. And I think between the first draft and the last draft. The penultimate chapter, which is where all the, the bad stuff happens, is almost word for word the same. So, no, I, I, I would never have um, had any other ending. Okay. Uh, I have a question from up here in the balcony. Oh. Here, here, inside, side, side, the other side. Here. Okay. Up here. Where? Up, up, up here. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, hi. Um, so, uh, my question is, uh, we've always thought that uh, Irish society was very uh, conservative. And, uh, you know, that not long ago, I mean, we still had this uh, abortion controversy and all those stuff about uh, should it be le made legal or not. So how did uh, same-sex marriage or, you know, uh, equal rights marriage became legal and how was it the first country that uh, made it legal? I mean, what was, the, what, is, what was the transformation from the island of before and island of now? Uh, well, in my view, it starts in 1990. It starts with the election of Mary Robinson as president of Ireland. Um, the first woman ever elected to the office, but also the first person not from the, the traditionally ruling party, Fianna Fáil. She was an independent barrister, human rights lawyer, activist, uh, and she was elected in 1990 against the, the candidate who was practically born for the job. And it was the moment where Ireland really began to change, uh, where the voices, particularly of women in Ireland, began to be heard. Uh, in her uh, acceptance speech on the night, she thanked Manona Heron, the women of Ireland, who had come out and voted in the way that their husbands didn't. Um, so it starts there, and then it moves on to the child abuse scandals in the church, which take you know 15 years, 20 years to resolve. And during that time, you have this entire generation, the older generation in Ireland, my parents' generation, who've spent a life trusting, believing in the church, and realize that their faith has been badly uh, rewarded, that they have been let down by everybody from the Pope downwards, and they've lost all confidence in the institution. So you've got that group there at the top, the old people. Then you've got the very young people, people under 25, who grew up never being interested in, in the church or the, in, because they've grown up seeing the Catholic Church as uh, an abusive institution and who are looking for an opportunity to cast a vote to say they want Ireland to be different. So when it came, it was the old and the young. It wasn't the middle-aged people. You know, when, the, um, when it happened, people liked to say it was a landslide. It wasn't a landslide. It was 60-40. So two out of every five people felt fundamentally that every adult in the country was not entitled to the same rights as every other adult. And that's the basic fundamental question. It's not about marriage. It's, is every adult entitled to the same rights? And two out of five people said no. And it was very much the middle age people, I would say people between 45 and 60, who didn't want that status quo to change. So I think it's Mary Robinson and it's the church. And even during the referendum, the church was very quiet in Ireland on that. I think they felt very much that they had lost their moral authority. And the day after the referendum, when it was passed, the Archbishop of Dublin, who was the senior prelate in Ireland, came out and made a speech in which he effectively said, look, it's a new world, you know, and we've got to change. We can't live in the, the dark ages, which at least was a positive thing. So we have, uh, we'll just take one more question from this young boy here. So as you were writing The Boy in Striped Pajamas, 
Did you have any challenges or difficulties as the writer? Oh yeah, plenty of them, um, as you always do with books. Uh, I suppose the biggest challenge was trying to decide how factual it needed to be and how factual it didn't need to be. You know, we're dealing with a very emotive subject and a subject where there are still people alive who've gone through it, survived it, but more who have lost so many people in it. So you don't want to disrespect it. You don't want to um, write something trivial, uh, but you are writing a novel. You know, it's a made up story. And um, the biggest challenge, I suppose, was that. It was trying to find the line between respecting the experience, the historical experience, and respecting the role of the novel in trying to explore it. So that was that, number one. Um, that was, prob that was probably the only one, to be honest. Trying to get inside the, 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 the mind of a nine-year-old again. It would have been a while since I was a nine-year-old. Um, but uh, trying to picture the world through his eyes. And most of Bruno's, I, I did that by most of Bruno's actions and his whole personality is based on entirely on who I was at that age. You know, he, his favorite book is one I mentioned earlier, Treasure Island. And that was my favorite book as a kid. Um, he uses all these, uh, you know, he, he hears adult phrases, like his sister is uh, the hopeless case, and he uses them in conversation. When I was that age, my brother one time called me a, a juvenile delinquent, and I went around for months calling everybody a juvenile delinquent. Um, even the way he dresses, his, his, I, I based him entirely on who I was at that age, just without the setting and the time period. Um, and, and that's the kind of like, innocent reasonably good-hearted, bookish, shy, um, introverted. He doesn't have any, many friends, you know, he's lonely. Um, so, re recalling all that uh, was a challenge, I suppose, as well. So we've run out of time, I'm afraid, so uh, thank you. Thank you. I think the book will be available out there and you can get it signed by uh, John if you want. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, John.